and welcome to part two, where I talk about the role of salt in blood pressure regulation and particularly its contribution to chronic hypertension. Now, unlike water, which when we drink water, when we take fluid on board, it gets processed in the renal system very quickly and we start to urinate that fluid very quickly. So when we, for example, go on a long journey, we often avoid having cups of tea and large amounts of fluid because we know we might not be able to find a service station to stop. So we get rid of the fluid we consume very quickly. Salt, on the other hand, takes a much longer time and often accumulates in our body. Now, when we take a lot of salt in our diet, then the first thing that we normally feel is thirst. We start to feel thirsty. So what we will do is we'll take on board more fluid that will increase the extracellular fluid and increase the blood volume, and then you get an increase in blood pressure. So that's the first way in which salt actually increases blood pressure. The second way is that when we're increasing the salt concentration in our extracellular fluid, we have increased osmolality, so increased concentration of salt in the extracellular fluid. Now, to try and balance that, we, it, there is a, the stimulation of the pituitary gland, which causes the release of antidiuretic hormone. And the clue of this hormone is in its name. So the antidiuretic hormone acts on the uh, renal system uh, to increase the absorption of water from the renal tubular fluid. So this is the, the, the water which is ready to be processed and then be urinated out. Because we have increased amount of salt osmolality in the extracellular fluid, we start to get the antidiuretic hormone causing reabsorption of fluid from the renal tubular fluid and of course we're going to get an increase in extracellular volume to normalize that concentration of salt and an increase in blood volume and therefore blood pressure. Now one of the other hormones which is very important in causing the reabsorption of water uh, and salt as well is aldosterone. Okay, so aldosterone is also released when we need to have uh, an increase in our blood volume. So when, when our blood volume actually drops, we'll also get a drop in blood pressure. Uh, and obviously if it's below normal, you get a release of these hormones to try and normalize the blood pressure. But in conditions such as, for example, obesity, we actually have an increase in the release of aldosterone and also angiotensin II, which is a, a very important hormone because it causes vasoconstriction as well as the reabsorption of water and salt from the renal tubular fluid. Now, both of these two are linked, uh, but before I talk about that, I just want to speak about angiotensin II. Now, I've got this diagram here, but it's probably going to be a bit too small for you to kind of uh, magnify onto the video, so I will draw onto it. What we've actually got with angiotensin II is a protein called renin, which is released by the kidneys. And we have another protein called angiotensinogen, angiotensinogen, which is released by the liver. Both of those combine together and they cause the production of angiotensin 1. Okay, so we'll just call that ang1. Okay, and in the endothelial cells of the pulmonary blood vessels, we start to get the release of an enzyme called angiotensin converting enzyme that produces angiotensin 2 which we can see here, and this is a very potent vasoconstrictor. So it causes constriction of the blood vessels and it causes an increase in systemic vascular resistance. Now, one thing that's important, and it's just actually come into my mind, is the role of baroreceptors. Okay, so baroreceptors detect changes in blood pressure um, and they're located in the aorta, the carotid uh, sinuses as well. Um, and basically when we have an increase in blood pressure, the baroreceptors are able to detect that and they're able to then reduce sympathetic nervous system activity and increase parasympathetic vagal tone. And we start to get vasodilation instead of vasoconstriction. Now baroreceptor activity is very important and in healthy individuals it does regulate moment to moment blood pressure. But at the moment it's not clear what the long-term effects of chronic hypertension is on baroreceptor activity. Um, and, but certainly in various disease states, such as obesity uh, and other inflammatory conditions, you have an increase in sympathetic nervous system activity, uh, and you may have reduced baroreflex sensitivity. But that's going slightly off topic. Going back onto topic, so angiotensin II is a potent vasoconstrictor, 
and it also actually increases the production of aldosterone as well. So it's promoting the reabsorption of sodium, salt, and water from the renal tubular fluid, which is going to increase the blood volume, or it's going to increase the extracellular fluid first, then an increase in blood volume, and then an increase in venous return, cardiac output, and blood pressure. So these are the three hormones which are, which are crucial for the regulation of uh, blood pressure. Now, if we get vasoconstriction from angiotensin II, we're going to get vasoconstriction in the, the blood vessels of the kidneys as well, so in the renal microvessels, so the very small vessels which are vital for the function of the kidneys, there's going to be uh, vasoconstriction in those renal microvessels as well, and that's going to compromise kidney function, and it's going to cause a shift of that renal output curve that we were talking about earlier to the right, and you're going to get a shift in the equilibrium point. So in the first part of the video, we were talking about equilibrium points and, and, and them changing. And one of the ways that happens is vasoconstriction of the renal microvessels, which will cause uh, impaired kidney function, which will mean basically that the kidneys cannot get rid of the excess fluid, so we have an increased blood volume and blood pressure, um, and that will cause a new equilibrium point at a higher blood pressure, and that will then feed up to chronic hypertension, so you would then develop uh, high blood pressure over a long period of time. Now, one of the, the treatments for, for high blood pressure is giving an angiotensin II receptor blocker or angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitor. And this will act upon this enzyme to, to try and reduce the blood pressure. You also get given diuretics as well. And diuretics are basically trying to get rid of the excess fluid within your blood to reduce the blood volume and hopefully then reduce the blood pressure. So hopefully this is a, a, a short summary of the way that salt can influence the production of various hormones, the first of which is the antidiuretic hormone, which prevents the loss of fluid from the kidneys and so increases blood volume. Aldosterone, which also increases the reabsorption of water and salt from the renal tubular fluid. And angiotensin II, which stimulates aldosterone so it does its activities, but it's also a potent vasoconstrictor. It increases systemic vascular resistance and it impairs uh, the renal microbiome microvascular function and ultimately renal function uh, as well. So when we think about chronic hypertension, it's very important for us to be able to understand the changes in our blood volume and how, how much of an impact they can have on cardiac output and blood pressure and be uh, aware that there's multiple factors that are contributing to uh, changes in the equilibrium point of the blood pressure. I hope you've enjoyed both of these parts. Please do feel free to leave comments and get in touch with me if you have any comments. Thank you very much for your time and I'll see you soon.